Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center and happy Constitution Day. It is so exciting to welcome you here on the 230th birthday of the US Constitution. And we've had such an exciting morning. We've heard from Ken Burns and Lynn Novak, interviewed by David Rubenstein about their new Vietnam documentary. We heard from the plaintiffs in the Brown versus Board of Education and Korematsu and Tinker cases. Their descendants came to talk about their experiences in those crucial cases. And now we're gonna hear about what every American should know about the Constitutional Convention and the founding documents from the person in America who's done more to increase public awareness of those documents than anyone else. Uh, David Rubenstein has had an extraordinary career. Um, early on in Washington, he worked as chief counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee under Senator Birch Ba. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge and honor Senator Bai, who's about to turn 90. Senator Bai is the only living American who was central to the framing of two constitutional amendments, the 25th Amendment involving presidential disability and the 26th Amendment giving 18-year-olds the right to vote. So if you would, please join me in expressing appreciation for Senator Bai. David went on to a distinguished career in the Carter White House. He is head of the Carlisle Group, and he's carved out this unique niche as America's leading patriotic philanthropist. And just to help you understand the depths of what he's doing for America, the documents you see here at the Constitution Center, that stone declaration of independence, those rare copies of the Bill of Rights, are lent by David, just as he's lent them to institutions around America, from the Library of Congress to the Smithsonian. Uh, but he is also a public educator who is really committed to the founder's vision of bringing together citizens of different perspectives so that they can educate themselves and other citizens about the Constitution. He's bringing together members of Congress. He interviews former presidents. You've seen his TV show where he's interviewed Presidents Bush and Clinton. He is a convener and an educator and a philanthropist who's just committed to sustaining the, the founders' values and making them alive today. He's now going to tell us about the founding documents, which he has uh, studied and collected, and describe what we all should know about the Constitutional Convention and the founding documents. And then I'll ask him some questions, and you can ask, ask some questions as well. Please join me in welcoming David Rubenstein. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, there is no greater pleasure in life than being introduced by Jeff Rosa. He always exaggerates. My mother would love to hear everything he says, and she's the person who would believe everything he says. So, uh, how many people here are from Philadelphia? I'm just curious. Okay, anybody from outside Philadelphia? Okay. How many people here really knew this was Constitution Day before you? Okay. How many people here took civics when you were in junior high school? Wow. Okay, how many people here are naturalized American citizens? Anybody? Oh, wow. Okay. So here's what I'd like to do. Um, I'd like to spend a little time before we have this session with Jeff answering a couple questions that I often think about myself and I'm asked about relating to the Constitution. So let's start with the first one. Why do we need a Constitution? What's the point of having a Constitution? When our country was created, roughly in 1776 when we fought the, began to fight, fight the war against the, uh, the British in the Revolutionary War, no country in the world had a constitution. There, was no, there were no constitutions. People had kings or they had common law, but they didn't really have constitutions. So why do we actually need a constitution? Well, when the Constitutional Convention uh, began, uh, it began in a situation where the country was not doing very well. Let me describe. We won the war against the British. It started in 1776. As you know, Independence Hall, now called Independence Hall, was where the Declaration of Independence was drafted or approved. And ultimately, it took us a number of years to win that war. Well, the war was over in 1781. It took two more years to actually come up with a peace agreement called the Treaty of Paris. So for between 1776 and 1783, the time we fought the war and the time we ended the war, we were operating under something called the Articles of Confederation. And when, the way that worked was there were 13 colonies. Each colony would come together in this Articles of Confederation Congress. Each one had one vote. And 
therefore, the big states, the small states, they were exactly the same. The big states obviously didn't think that was fair. Small states loved it. The problem was, in those days, that uh, you couldn't get anything done under the Articles of Confederation. There really wasn't a, an executive. There really wasn't a president. There was a president of the Congress, but there was really just a Congress. And the Articles of Confederation did not allow this Congress to tax the states without their permission. And of course, the states didn't want to be taxed. They also didn't allow the states to have an army or to, to, uh, to, to really bring an army together. There was no power to bring an army together. So without the power to tax, without the power to uh, bring an army together, the Articles of Confederation made the 13 colonies relatively weak. In fact, at some point, it was thought that some foreign countries would do alliances with some of the states, and some of the states would actually become parts of different countries, and the Articles of Confederation uh, states would, would fall apart. It wasn't clear after the, we won the war in 1783 and it was resolved that actually this country would really survive. So from 1783 to roughly 1787, the country was not doing very well. We were afraid of, of additional attacks from other uh, foreign countries. Uh, and it turns out, as you know, it wasn't that easy for these countries, for these uh, states to get together. To go from, let's say, Georgia up to Massachusetts could take a month or two to get there if you didn't go by water. It would take a long time. Communications are very weak. The states really had very little in common. In fact, when the original, um, uh, cons when the, when the original Continental Congress was convened in, in, uh, in Philadelphia in 1774, at that time, people came to Philadelphia. More people who came to that, uh, that, that meeting the, uh, uh, actually had been to London than had been to Philadelphia. In other words, of the people who came here for, the, uh, for that, con for that uh, gathering, very few of them had actually ever been to Philadelphia before because people didn't travel between the states that much. You basically had your relationships with England. So we had a very weak system of government. We were afraid that the country wasn't going to survive. And the man who was really the most interested in this country surviving, who had almost given his life for it, was George Washington. George Washington, after he would won the war on behalf of the Americans, he retired to Mount Vernon. At that time, he never tended to go back into public life. And he was worried, though, that the country was falling apart. And what he had fought for so hard, and so many men had like, given their lives for, would actually not come to pass. And the, the country would disintegrate. And actually, the great war that we had won would, uh, would be for nothing. So he was importuned by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, others, to try to figure out whether there was a way to bring together the country and have a better form of government. So what happened was there was a, a meeting in Annapolis. And it was designed to theoretically amend the Articles of Confederation. But it was really a bit of a subterfuge, and James, Madison, and others were really looking for a way to create a whole new set of government. And to do that, they needed to have George Washington present. So what they decided to do was to convince him that he should come to this new group that they were going to uh, convene called a Constitutional Convention, as it ultimately became to be known. And George Washington went back and forth. He wasn't sure whether he should come or not, because if he came and it failed, it would hurt his prestige. If he didn't come and the Articles of Confederation continued, the country might fall apart and what he had fought for so hard might, might disintegrate. Ultimately, he concluded he would come. And ultimately, each of the states were asked to send people to this Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. It was to begin in May of 1787. So the first question is, why do we need a constitution? Well, we needed something different because the Articles of Confederation wasn't working and the country was probably going to disintegrate. The second question is, what was the Constitutional Convention and how did it actually work and how did it succeed in coming up with something that's now lasted for 230 years? Think about this. It was yesterday, 230 years ago, that the uh, framers agreed to the Constitutional Convention, 230 years ago, and it's basically still in existence. So how did it happen? Well, each of the states were asked to send people. There were 13 colonies. Rhode Island um, just said, we don't want anything part of this. We don't, we're not going to send anybody. So Rhode Island never sent anybody to the Constitutional Convention. They didn't really want to change the Articles of Confederation. And uh, as a small state, they were actually pretty happy because as a small state, they had an equal vote to the big states. The most important states in the, those days were Virginia, which was uh, the most probably the biggest state in terms of population, Pennsylvania and uh, Massachusetts. So delegates were sent. Ultimately, 75 people were appointed by the 13 colonies. Only about 55 actually ever showed up. They came to Philadelphia in May. And when they, they came here, they, they didn't know what they were going to do. Many of these people didn't know each other. Almost all of them were people who had public backgrounds. Everyone had served in public office before. Many of them were lawyers. Almost all of them were reasonably wealthy. Uh, they were all male. They were all white, they were all Christian, and virtually all of them were Protestant. There were only two that were Catholic. There were nobody, nobody Jewish, obviously no blacks, and there were no Muslims, there was nobody else. It was all white, male, Protestant. 
And that's not un unusual at that time. And of course, the idea that having women never occurred to anybody. So they came together, and they were trying to set up rules of how to operate. And the first thing they did was they said, we need to operate in secrecy. Because if we have to have, if people know what we're doing, it'll, it'll get out, and ultimately people will find what we're talking about offensive. Before we can come to a final agreement, it, it won't come to pass. So they, one of the rules was it had to be secret. Second rule was nothing is decided until everything is decided. In other words, we'll have lots of debates, we'll agree on something, but until everything is decided, nothing is really decided. That way they could have free, uh, free wheeling debates, and they might agree on something, but later if something else was decided a different way, they might have to change what they'd already decided on. They also uh, wanted to make sure that everybody had a chance to be heard, and so everyone was allowed to, uh, to talk as freely as they wanted. George Washington was selected as the head of the Constitutional Convention, though he actually almost never talked at the, at the convention. He presided, but he never, almost never said anything. Uh, most of the discussions were off the, rec or, or off the record, perhaps, and perhaps we don't really know what he said. Uh, the, the person who kept most of the records was James Madison, who, right there, James Madison. Now, James Madison, uh, you were a lineal descendant of his, I guess, right? Well, I am James Madison. You are James Madison, okay. <laughs> James Madison uh, was the person who was often called the father of the Constitution. I think many ways he should be, though I want to clarify a little bit later what he did and didn't do. So wh when they came together, they uh, agreed to, to spend some time getting to know each other, and many of these people didn't know each other. George Washington was the great man. He was, not, he was going to house with the others in a, in a boarding house, but ultimately the wealthiest man in the city, and one of the wealthiest men in the country, Robert Morris, uh, gave him his house to, to live at, and that's where he lived. So when they came together, they began to have uh, conversations, and the great debate was over one issue. How do, we rep how do we have a Congress and how is it to be represented? And all of you probably remember from, from grade school or high school, the great debate was how do, should we have a, uh, a Congress that's dependent on the size of the state or the number of states? In other words, should we have a, a, a uh, congressional body that every state gets one vote or two votes or that's proportional to the population? James Madison came in with a, what was called the Virginia Plan, and he uh, formulated it, somebody else presented it, but the essence of it was he believed that every uh, body in the Congress should be, rep should be proportional. In other words, there should be two houses of Congress, and it was, why two houses of Congress? Well, most of the state legislatures that had lived, that existed under the colonial days had two houses, legis two, two legislative bodies. And that was because the British system had a House of Lords, a House of Commons, and so most of the colonial legislators uh, legislatures had two houses. One was so-called upper house, generally smaller, and a, and a lower house, uh, somewhat bigger. And that was, so it was always taken that there were probably two houses of Congress. James Madison's view under the, under the Virginia plan was that each house should be proportional. There shouldn't be uh, each state uh, having the same number of votes. So Rhode Island, let's say, if they were involved, shouldn't have the same number of uh, votes in one of the bodies as Virginia or Massachusetts. And that was the big debate. Now, obviously, Madison being from a large state, the biggest state in terms of population, that was not surprising. That didn't go over well with the small states, and so that was a major debate for quite some time. Ultimately, it was resolved in what we now know as uh, the Connecticut plan, and under that plan, we decided to have, it was decided they would have two houses where one would be proportional, the House of Representatives, and one would be, um, depending on the number of states you have, each state would have the same number of, uh, of senators, and it was decided to have two. So that was the greatest debate that they had throughout the, throughout the entire Constitutional Convention. There were other, many other debates, but that was the most important single debate probably that they had. Once that was resolved, they could go on to other issues. And that debate actually took, took almost four months. The, the Constitutional Convention went from May to September. Uh, one of the other debates was who should be the executive and what is the executive. It wasn't really clear whether, what an executive was. None of them really wanted to have a king. They had gotten rid of King George. They didn't really want an, uh, somebody that was a hereditary king. They were thinking they should have an executive, but there was no strong executive under the Articles of Confederation, so they wasn't, weren't quite sure what to do, and they were thinking for a long time they would have a committee that would be the executive, and sometimes they weren't sure who it should pick the committee. Should it be the legislature? Should it be the Senate? Should it be the state legislatures? Ultimately, they came up with the idea of calling this leader a president, and they ultimately decided to have just one person do it. They were going to have the person serve one seven-year term. Ultimately, towards the end, they, they came up with no limit on how many times you could serve as president in four-year term. And it wasn't clear exactly 
uh, what the president would do, but it was pretty much known that George Washington would likely be the first president, and that's probably why they gave the title to him as well as commander in chief, because it was recognized that, that George Washington would likely be the first president, and he obviously had the capabilities of being the commander in chief as well. One of the other big debates was what to do with slavery. Slavery had become a very big part of the United States. At the time of the, of the revolution, and uh, at the time of the Constitutional Convention, roughly 20% of all Americans were slaves. Uh, only about 2% in, uh, in the North, but about 40% uh, of people living in the South were slaves. And the Southern states cared very much to not change that system. The Northern states weren't, uh, I would say, abolitionists. They didn't think slavery was a good system. They didn't want to be part of it. They thought it'd be a good idea to get rid of slavery, but they really didn't fight very hard to get rid of slavery. They just didn't want it to encroach on their system. So ultimately, there were very, very few moral debates in the Constitutional Convention about whether to get rid of slavery. It was recognized the Southern states would not participate in the country and wouldn't be part of the Constitution if we were going to get rid of slavery. So the issue was, how do you address it? And ultimately, as you probably all know, it was decided that slavery would be allowed in existing states. No slaves could be imported after 1808, so they'd give another uh, 20 years or so before slavery importation would end. And it was thought at the time that probably the southern states would actually be happy with that because the fewer slaves that were coming in, uh, that would increase the value of the slaves they already had in terms of uh, the value of them. The, the debate was, was over how do you regard these, these slaves for purposes of, of uh, proportion and rep representation. If you're going to have uh, proportionate representation in the House of Representatives, do you count slaves as, as people or do you not count them as people? Well, of course, the Southerners argued for purposes of proportional representation in the House of represent Representatives, each slave would count as one person. But for purposes of taxing, and if the federal government was to, was to tax states based on their wealth, the wealth uh, that was attributed to slavery was not to be counted, the Southerners would say. So ultimately, there was an inconsistency, but it was resolved this way. In the end, they used a formula they had used in the Articles of Confederation for taxing purposes, and slaves were counted as three-fifths of a white person. So all the slaves in the South were counted for purposes of representation as three-fifths of one person. Uh, there was no serious effort to get rid of slavery because it wasn't really thought that it was realistic at that time to do so. So after back and forth, back and forth, they basically came ready to come up with the proposal. They had a committee that resolved many of their, their disagreements. They had a committee to kind of uh, put things together to write it up in one form. James Madison was uh, not on that final committee. The committee was actually led by a man named Governor Morris, who actually drafted what we now call the Constitution. It was actually in his uh, language and his writing uh, that we actually have uh, the Constitution. But Right before the end, as they had agreed to everything and they wanted to go home, remember, there was no air conditioning in the Philadelphia in those days. And they had agreed that everything was to be secret. So they couldn't keep the windows open. So on the first floor of Independence Hall, they had to keep the windows closed and they also had to have them kind of covered up so nobody could see in or nobody could hear what they were doing. Sometimes they'd go to the second floor where they could keep the windows open. People probably couldn't hear them, they thought. But they were ready to go home. They were tired of the big flies coming in. They had to swat them away. They were here for four months. Many of them didn't like each other. And they, you know, they had other businesses. They had other jobs they had to do. So they couldn't wait to go home. But about five days before the end, when they just about reached an agreement on everything, one man, George Mason, said from Virginia, well, where's the Bill of Rights? We have no Bill of Rights in this. How can we have a Constitution without a Bill of Rights? And they said, well, geez, we don't have time for that. And besides, we don't need a Bill of Rights. The state, let the state uh, constitutions give a Bill of Rights. And besides, we're not taking any, any rights away from anybody, so we don't need a Bill of Rights. There was a debate over that, but in the end, it went unanimously agreed, with the exception of George Mason and two other people, that there would be no Bill of Rights. So the Constitution was agreed to on uh, September the 17th, of, of 1787, and then they had to get it ratified. And the agreement on ratification was very interesting. Uh, remember, the, the whole process of the Constitutional Convention was originally, theoretically, to be an amendment of the Articles of Confederation. They were really doing an unfriendly takeover of the Articles of Confederation government. The Articles of Confederation government didn't say, have a new Constitution to replace us. That wasn't the intent. Originally, the Constitutional Convention was really supposed to modify the Articles of Confederation, but of course it got bigger than that. So ultimately, though, when they agreed to the Constitution, they had to go back to the Articles of Confederation Congress and say, well, guess what? We have a new Constitution. And the Articles of Confederation members of Congress could say, wait a second, we're not going out of business. We're, we're here and we're in control. You can't just amend the Constitution that way or our Articles of Confederation. But ultimately, the Articles of Confederation Congress, recognizing that the system was weak, they took the Constitution 
that had been sent to them, and they sent it out to each of the states for ratification. So they basically went along with it. And each of the states was to put a separate uh, uh, convention together to ratify. It wasn't so clear that it would be ratified because many people didn't like the idea that the federal government was going to be more powerful than it was under the Articles of Confederation. They didn't like, in some cases, there was proportional representation. Some people didn't like the fact that slavery was still going to stay there in the, in the Constitution or in the system. And some people didn't like the fact that the president had the powers that he had, not as much as we've seen today, but the president had a lot of powers. So there were many things that weren't very popular. But one of the things that was the most unpopular was there was no Bill of Rights. And it became clear that one of the people who most fought against the Bill of Rights being included recognized that it had to be changed, and that was James Madison. James Madison, who was often called the father of the Constitution, he did draft much of the things that are in the Constitution, a lot of it was his ideas, and he, did, he kept the records. There was an official record keeper in the Constitutional Convention, but James Madison did a much better job, and he kept the meticulous notes every day, and at night he would go back to his boarding house and write them up. And those are the most thorough notes we have of what happened at the Constitutional Convention. He said it would not uh, make it public until the last member of the Constitutional Convention died. And the last mention of the person of the Constitutional Convention who died was James Madison. <laughs> so upon his death, it ultimately became public. And that's how we really know what went on, what we believe went on. I think he was pretty good. We don't, we don't think he was making himself look good by the uh, notes he was taking. We think he was pretty accurately coming up with things. But he thought, thought at the end, we don't need a Bill of Rights. He thought it would slow down getting the Constitutional Convention approved. But ultimately, as it went through ratification, it became clear that without a Bill of Rights, many of the states would not ratify it. So promises were more or less made that there would be a Bill of Rights in the new Congress, and that's how, why Virginia probably went along with it, among other states. So the Constitutional Convention uh, was pretty successful, came up with a document we're still living with 230 years later. What were the two biggest mistakes or the biggest mistakes they made in the Constitutional Convention? Well, I think there were two. One was they allowed slavery to continue. I don't know that they could have ever eliminated slavery, but you could call it a birth defect. And it was so serious a birth defect that it led to the Civil War. I think the Founding Fathers recognized that slavery was morally wrong, at least in the case of the Northerners, they recognized it. Even many of the Southerners recognized it, but they didn't really know how to get out of uh, slavery, so they ultimately continued it, recognizing that probably it would, in their view, die out at some point, but they didn't think it would probably lead to a civil war. The other big mistake was the Bill of Rights. They didn't actually have one, and as I said, they had to get to a Bill of Rights later. In the first, con in the first Congress of the United States, James Madison followed through on his promise. He drafted up a Bill of Rights. He was a member of the House of Representatives. He drafted it up went back to the Senate, back and forth, and ultimately 12 um, amendments were agreed to by the Congress. They went out to the public and went out to the state legislators, and um, 10 of them became um, part of the Bill of Rights, became the Bill of Rights. Two of the 12 were not approved, but um, one of them subsequently was approved. Uh, and one of the ones that was not subsequently, was not originally approved of the 12 was now what's now called the Madison Amendment, known as the 27th Amendment, the last amendment of the Constitution. It's very interesting. That amendment said that members of Congress could not increase their salary during the term of which they were elected. So let's say a member of Congress couldn't say, I've just been elected, now I want to increase my salary by 10 times. Why could they not do that? Well, they thought it was appropriate that if you're going to increase your salary as a member of Congress, you should at least go through an election so people could um, know that you were going to have your salary increased in the next Congress, and therefore you might be voted in or you might be voted out, but people would know that your salary was going to increase. It couldn't increase in the Congress in which you were, you were serving. Okay, so why would that get voted down? Well, it was thought by most people in the country that members of Congress should never have a salary increase. So they didn't want to have a salary increase at any point. So the idea of having any salary increase was why they really voted it down. But subsequently, a few years ago, it did become a member, uh, amendment to the Constitution, the 27th Amendment. So first question is, why do we need a Constitution? We needed one because the Articles of Confederation was not working. How did the Constitutional Convention work? Well, it worked in secrecy. It worked with 55 people coming together. 39 actually signed it. Not all of them actually signed it. Three of them did not sign it because they didn't have a Bill of Rights. George Mason was one of them. Elbridge Gerry was another. And Edmund Randolph of Virginia was the third who didn't sign it because it lacked a Bill of Rights. Ultimately, Bill of Rights became part of it. And so the two major defects, I think, in the Constitutional Constitution were the lack of a um, uh, Bill of Rights initially, which was corrected, and the, and the continuation of slavery, which ultimately was dealt with in the Civil War and subsequent amendments. Today, if the Constitutional uh, Convention founding fathers were to come back, what would they think of the system that they now see? I think they would think that they, they would be shocked that something they drafted 230 years ago is still in effect. I think they would be shocked that the president has become so powerful relative to what they anticipated. 
I think they would be shocked that the, that the courts have become so powerful in interpreting the Constitution. I don't think they ever anticipated that. I think they would be probably surprised that the Electoral College method that they came up with, which is a Jerry-built uh, system, Rube Goldbergish system to elect a president, they didn't really know whether it should be direct election or through some other means, but that, that means more or less is still operating. I think they would probably be surprised about that. And probably they'd be surprised that something that has survived for 230 years that they crafted in four months is really not only made our country so successful in the way we operate in many ways, but has become the model for constitutions around the rest of the world. So what is the last question I'd like to address before Jeff and I have a conversation is, why is it so important that people know something about the Constitution, and how can we do a better job of letting people know about it? Well, I think it's important for all citizens to know about the country in which they live and how it's governed, because you know what rights and obligations you have as a citizen, what your responsibilities are. It's a sad situation that actually very few people do know as much as we'd like them to know. Today, many of you may have been educated about this, but most people in the country today don't receive civics education. Civics used to be taught in junior high school. It's not taught anymore. Uh, American history is not taught very much. In fact, uh, and you can become a major in, um, in history in almost any college in the United States and still graduate as a major in history and not get a uh, degree and not, not have to take a course in American history. And of course, in almost every college in this country, you can graduate and not take any course in history, let alone American history. So we don't really have as many people knowing about our history as much as they should. Uh, recently, Annenberg, uh, maybe 10 days ago, released a uh, study, the Annenberg Center at uh, University of Pennsylvania, indicated that, hard to believe, but 75% of Americans, when asked to name um, a branch of the US government, uh, couldn't name all three branches. 75% of the Americans cannot name the three branches of government. Only 25% of Americans can name the three branches of government. And in fact, uh, it's hard to believe as well, but one third of Americans, when asked, could not name a single branch of government. So, Obviously, we haven't done as good a job as we should in educating people about our Constitution. So one of the things about the Constitution Center and the Constitution Day is to try to remind people of this extraordinary document. When you think about it, you had 55 white males came together. They created a document that has lived 230 years with 27 amendments, 10 of which are the Bill of Rights. And uh, some of the amendments have gone away. So prohibition was one amendment, then we abolished it, so that was two amendments. But basically, relatively modest amendments. And the idea that you can have such an incredible document uh, create, help to create such a country is make, makes the document worth studying. I don't know whether this country would have become the most powerful country in the world, the most uh, desirable country in the world in which to live. More immigrants come to this country every year than go to any other country by far. If we'd had a different document, maybe, we, maybe if we had a different document, different constitution, maybe we would still be powerful, maybe we'd still have been as uh, successful as we've been, but I'm not sure. The Constitution had a, a lot of things in there that we should be very proud of, particularly the Bill of Rights. And so I think all of us should be proud of a country in which we live that has a document that is the envy of the world. Well, now, there are imper imperfections for, for sure, and we are often uh, trying to figure out how we can make the Constitution better, and occasionally we're amending it. And clearly, the slavery issue was one that was a terrible birth defect in our initial Constitution. But today, given where we are, while there are imperfections in our society, the Constitution is the living and breathing part of our society that we should know more about. Final point, we don't have a, in our Constitution, in our country, a, a, a official religion. We don't have an official religion. Uh, that's great. It's in the First Amendment that no uh, government really, uh, the government should not impose a religion. People have religious freedom. But in some ways, we do have a religion, and the religion is the Constitution. The Constitution is like the, the biblical Torah in many ways, and the founding fathers are like ancient prophets. And so we idolize them a bit, maybe more than we should, but I don't think so, because I think George Washington, James Madison, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and Alexander Hamilton, among many others, did a great service for our country and for all of us in helping to create a document that we're still living with many, many years later that gives us the rights and the freedoms and the opportunities that we all have. Many of us have come from very modest circumstances, as I have, and we might not have been able to rise to where we are today if we didn't have a country that allowed us to have these rights and these opportunities. So I think all of us should be proud of the country we have and the Constitution. And today, I hope you'll take some time in thinking about the Constitution, how it came together, how it works, how it's a living and breathing document, and how it's almost like a civic religion for all of us, because we really trust the Constitution. We believe the Constitution is the ultimate source of power, the ultimate source of what is right and wrong in our country. And I think uh, all of us should be proud to be citizens in a country that has a constitution that's the envy of the world. Thank you.
Thank you so much, David, for that superb and inspiring speech. You have distilled for us with meaning and intensity what all of us should know about the Constitution on Constitution Day. And you have told us why the Constitutional Convention was called and what the rules of procedure were and what the main debates about the presidency and Congress were and the two mistakes of slavery and the Bill of Rights, which were eventually remedied. And ladies and gentlemen, I want you to listen closely to what David said. And if there are any areas of those learnings that are unfamiliar to you, go back and learn more about them because you must master this as part of your duty of civic education. David, I want to pick up first on your last uh, thought experiment, which is what would the founders make of our democracy today? And I want to go through each of the four branches of government and just ask you to say a little bit more, channeling the founders on what they would make of our current presidency, Congress, courts, and media. We have a new Madisonian commission at the Constitution Center, co-chaired by senators and Congress people from both parties, designed to answer that question over the next two years, and it's crucially important. So let's begin with the presidency. You said that the founders debated how strong to make the presidents. They initially, Madison wanted the president to be elected by the legislature. Wilson wanted popular election. The compromise was the Electoral College. What would the founders make of our presidency today? I think they would be stunned that the president has become the center of U.S. government. The, the, the representative of the U.S. government around the world is not the U.S. Congress, but it's the president of the United States. Um, we now have on our 45th president, and I think these presidents have taken on a life of their own, and they have the power that no, no founding father really envisioned. Even George Washington, who they all idolized, didn't have the power, I think, that the current presidents have in many ways. So I think that they would be most surprised the president has become the embodiment, really, the symbol of U.S. government. Obviously, we have branches of government. We have the separation of powers. I think the presidency has taken on, on such a great power that, as we've discussed earlier today, Presidents have been able to send troops into war without declarations of war. So the Vietnam War, we lost 58,000 Americans uh, and 200-some thousand wounded. We never had an official declaration of war. Um, in Iraq, and um, we never had an official declaration of war. I think the Founding Fathers would be surprised that we've sent troops overseas and had so many Americans killed in overseas wars without declarations of, of war being declared by Congress. That was something that I think they would have been surprised about. In Federalist 10, Madison said that the worst vice to be avoided in democracy was for presidents and representatives to communicate directly with their constituents. So this is asked in a truly nonpartisan spirit, but what would the founders have made of tweeting presidents? Well, for those who don't know what the Federalist was, let me just describe that before I answer your question. The Federalist, uh, when the ratification process was going forward, it wasn't really clear that this document, which was gonna give so much power to some states and maybe take away from power from other states and give the power to tax to a federal government and to give the power to raise an army to a federal government, that this was gonna be approved. And so three individuals, really led by Alexander Hamilton, the others were James Madison and John Jay, they, uh, in trying to help New York uh, ratify, they wrote under a pseudonym uh, these so-called Federalist Papers. They were published in newspapers, ultimately combined in books, and there were 85 of them. And they are the best statement about what our Constitution was really supposed to be um, in the view of the people that created it. And so in the Federalist Papers, if you go back and read them, you really have the best survey of what the founders really thought their Constitution was going to be. And I think it was probably helpful in the uh, ratification process in New York. And I think while it wasn't intended to help the ratification process in other states, some of the Federalist Papers did go to other states, and I think it was important. I think George Washington read a number of them, and he circulated some of them to the legislators who were approving the New York, uh, the, improving the, uh, the uh, Constitution in Virginia. I think in terms of tweeting, I don't know that they would be able to have a comment on that. I just, I, I just don't know what they would think. But I, I do think that, that the Congress uh, was thought to be the embodiment of the, of the country at the time, and the Congress was really where all the power was supposed to be. And over the years, we've obviously seen power go away from Congress and towards the president. I think they would probably think that the dysfunction of Congress, they can't pass very much, is something they didn't anticipate. And also, they didn't anticipate political parties. There were no political parties at the time, and there was a feeling that we didn't want to have political parties. There were political parties in England, and there was a feeling that that really hadn't worked. So when the Constitution was drafted, the idea of political parties didn't really exist, and I think they would be shocked to see how politically divisive the Congress has become. So two crucial points David has made. First, as he said, the founders fear that Congress, not the president, will be the most dangerous 
branch, and Madison is determined to limit Congress's power to avoid tyranny, and also didn't anticipate the rise of political parties. It wasn't until the election of 1800 that Madison, ironically, having uh, forsworn parties, presides over the establishment of the Republican and Democratic Party, uh, which they couldn't have anticipated. And you're, but, you're correct. Let me just make yeah. a point. The reason that they didn't want a strong president was they had had a king that they didn't think was very good. They had had governors in states that were appointed by the king or the parliament, and they didn't like these um, people who they thought were violating their rights. So they really feared an executive. They feared an aristocrat. They feared, feared a hereditary kind of uh, leader. And so they really wanted to make the presidency um, one where somebody had the job for a short period of time, but he, and not she, uh, was, uh, was not to be so that powerful. And I didn't mention earlier, I should have mentioned, that one of the problems with the Constitution at the convention was it didn't address slavery, but there was another thing they didn't address. There was not one word of debate in the entire Constitutional Convention about giving rights to women. Not one word. Uh, the idea that women would be eligible uh, to be in government just didn't exist in their minds. It wasn't even discussed for, for a second. Uh, there was no uh, idea that women would be, would be participating. That's why it is amazing when you think about it, uh, the people who were putting this Constitutional Convention together they were not really representative of the country. 85% of the people living in this country, 3 million people, 85% of the people worked on small farms. About 5% worked on bigger farms. Very few people lived in cities. At the time, Philadelphia had a, it was a population, I think, of about 40,000 people. That was about it. There were only two cities bigger than 25,000. The other was New York. It was a very small country in, in cities in many ways. And most people were living on farms. The founding fathers were not really representative. They were all educated. All had served in government before. All were reasonably wealthy. They were all, as I said, white, male, and and um, and uh, Protestant, with the exception of two Catholics. So it wasn't very representative. And at one point, I just um, digress for one more moment. Think about this today. Suppose we said we're going to get rid of the Constitutional Convention, and we can. Uh, the Constitution. Under the Constitution, there are two ways to amend it. You can amend it by uh, getting two thirds of each house to agree to something, and then three quarters of the states. You can amend the Constitution that way. Or there's one other way that's never been used. You can have a new Constitutional Convention convened, which can be approved by, I, I believe it's uh, three quarters of the, of the, of the uh, members of each house. Three quarters of the members of each house, you can have a new Constitutional Convention. Suppose we had that. Suppose three quarters of the members of each house said, you know what, this system's 230 years old, and you know, we, cell phones don't last for more than a, a year. Why should a Constitution last for 230 years? Let's try something different. So how would you have a new Constitution, and would it be better? So think about this. We had 55 people in the Constitutional Convention. There were 3 million people. Proportionally, if you were going to have the same proportion, you'd have 5,500 people in, in a Constitutional Convention, because we have about 1,000 times as many people. But let's assume we had a reasonable number of people, 100 people in a new Constitutional Convention, as approved by the Congress. Who would those people be? Who were the people that, who would be the next Madisons, Washingtons, um, Franklins, Hamiltons. Do we know who these people are? Do we see them? Well, they may be hidden somewhere. We don't see them as much as we might like to see them. And what would they come up with? And I think it would be a wonderful study, and maybe some foundation someday can find 100 very talented people, put them together for two months, and figure out what government they would come with and would it come up with and would it, whether it would be better than what we have now. I suspect it wouldn't be much better, even though we had an unrepresentative group come up with the Constitution. It, it, it's a pretty good system, and it's the envy of the world, as I said earlier. So it is uh, something that we, we have to marvel at how they came up with something in four months that we're still living with 230 years later. Well, this question of why our deliberative bodies today seem less enlightened than the time of the framing leads to this second question, what would the framers make of Congress? And you talked about the polarization and the rise of parties, but why has it become dysfunctional and undeliberative in a way the framers didn't anticipate. We talked earlier about the recent suggestion of Ryan Lizza of The New Yorker, who in one of our first meetings of this Madisonian Commission said the problem is transparency. The fact that all congressional deliberations are reported in real time makes compromise impossible. And David's second point about the procedures of the convention were that no vote was final until everyone had had the chance to talk and that it was in secret. So trans do you believe, do you agree with Ryan, that transparency is an issue, and what are other structural changes that have made our Congress today less deliberative than they hoped? You know, there are certain words that in today's society everybody loves. So who's against the word diversity? Nobody. Who's against the word equitable? Nobody. Who's against the word infrastructure? Nobody. Who's against the word uh, transparency? Nobody. 
But the truth is, transparency isn't always perfect. So all of you probably have conversations in your business, your personal lives. You wouldn't want them to be on the front page of the newspapers the next day because they're very private. You say certain things in private that you don't really want public. And the same thing is true in Congress. Because everything is so transparent now, members are afraid of saying anything that might be criticized by somebody on their far right if they're Republican or far left if they're a Democrat. And so members of Congress are very skittish about doing very much, and they're very afraid of not getting reelected. It's an interesting thing. Members of Congress, there are 535 members of Congress. 98% uh, of the people in the House of Representatives, representatives who run for re-election um, in a general election win. And sometimes they lose in a primary, but mostly they get re-elected. And most senators, probably 85% of them who run for re-election win. Um, so it's not a great danger that they're going to lose, but they're so deathly afraid of it. Now, when you talk to members of Congress after they lose an election or they retire, they say, I wish I had retired earlier. I wish I had lost my election earlier because I'm never as happy as I am now because they're doing something else. But they're deathly afraid of losing this position. So as a result of that, they have a very sad life in my view. They have to have two homes. They have a very modest salary. The salary for a member of Congress is modest by my standards, maybe not by everybody's standards. It's about $175,000. They have to support two, a family, and they also have two homes typically. So as a result of that, most members of Congress are either extremely wealthy or they are really poor. And if they're really poor, they don't have wealth, they live in the House of Representatives. 75 members of the House of Representatives, or 435 members, 75 have to live in their offices because they can't afford a second apartment. 75 members. So is that a good system? Probably not, though they get to exercise a lot more in the gym where they shower in the mornings. But other than that, it's probably not a good system. So I think members of Congress are, are afraid of losing. They're afraid of retiring. And, and, and right now, they, they're just afraid that everything they do will be on the internet. Everything will be on talk radio. And as a result, members of Congress, I don't, don't think really know each other very much and are afraid of getting together. When I worked in Congress for Senator Birch Bayh, Democrats and Republicans talk to each other, and that's how you got deals done. Today, you rarely see Democrats and Republicans socializing, and in fact, you rarely see Democrats voting for a Republican bill or Republicans voting for a Democratic bill. They try to do things, with some exceptions recently, with one party, and it doesn't really work very well. The Founding Fathers would be astounded if they came back to see how divisive the Congress is. That idea of both parties talking together has definitely changed. Our new chair, Vice President Joe Biden, told an amazing story about how when he came to Congress, John Stennis, the Southern segregationist, told him, just go sit at the end of the lunch table and listen to the conversations. And he heard Republicans and segregationists talking about their families and their health problems, and they bonded and they became friends. And he said, no, no one has lunch together. Well, they also, they, generally Congress is a Tuesday to Thursday type of thing. You generally, now you don't have votes except on Tuesday to Thursdays. So they go home Thursday night, they're meeting with their constituents, they're raising money, they're dealing with their families, whatever they're doing. So on uh, Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, they're basically home, and maybe they should be meeting with their constituents, but they're only spending a limited amount of time together. And as a result, they don't know each other that well. They don't trust each other very much. Um, I've created some programs in Congress where I try to get members of Congress to come together for dinners and so forth, and try to ask them to sit with people from the opposite party. And they tell me this is the one of the rare occasions where they actually get to talk to people from the opposite party, because it's not really something that they're allowed to do very much publicly anymore. Re replicating the Constitutional Convention where people of different perspectives were forced, were locked in the room together and forced to be in secret. All right, the judiciary. You said it's become much stronger than the founders would have anticipated because it's Constitution Day. One other important bit of, you know, wonkery or learning. Why is it that the courts have the power to strike down laws? Where does the power of judicial review come from? Ha Hamilton says that when there's a conflict between the will of the people represented by the Constitution and the will of their uh, servants represented by the legislator, you prefer the master to the servant, the principal to the agent. So that's the whole theory, that the Constitution represents the will of the people more than those ordinary laws do, and that's why judges can strike down laws in the name of the Constitution. But w what would they have made of a world where the Supreme Court is wow. deciding all of our political questions? Is it an appropriate response to the fact that the powers of the President and Congress have grown? Should the courts grow accordingly, or have they, has have things gotten out of balance? Well, the courts um, were not really envisioned as being that important when the Constitutional Convention was set up. They, they dealt with it in a, just a few uh, short discuss discussions in their Constitutional Convention. And think about this. The first Chief Justice of the United States was named John Jay. Uh, he had been a New York uh, person who was involved in helping the, the, uh, uh, in the Revolutionary War. He was well respected from a very proper family. 
when he was Chief Justice of the United States, appointed by George Washington, he was asked by George Washington to go over to uh, England to negotiate a treaty. So he was gone for six months negotiating a treaty. So in other words, the Chief Justice was not thought to be so independent. He was negotiating a treaty on behalf of the, of the administration. Uh, another time, uh, Robert Jackson was a justice on the Supreme Court. He went and became the prosecutor under the Nuremberg trials. So obviously, that was an unusual kind of situation. Earl Warren became the head of the Warren Commission to investigate uh, the, uh, uh, the Kennedy assassination. So we, we have a, we've changed our view on what judges and justices should do. We used to think they could have other side jobs. Abe Fortas apparently advised President Johnson as an advisor when he was on the Supreme Court, not probably something he was supposed to do, but our standards have changed. Today, the Supreme Court is really elevated in a certain uh, level beyond what anybody, I think, in the Founding Fathers would have thought would be the case. The justices are pretty well respected. There are many reasons for that. They would say maybe because they're not televised. Uh, we don't televise the Supreme Court uh, hearings, and that's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, maybe it's because when you actually see somebody up close, you may not think as well of them. I don't know why they don't televise it, but I don't think they're going to televise it. They have some very good reasons not to do it. I don't think they're going to do it anytime soon. But for whatever reason, the justices of the Supreme Court are really um, highly regarded people. They have um, uh, really independent views on things that are not viewed as favoring one party or another necessarily, or one economic interest or another. And that is not probably what the Founding Fathers envisioned. In those days, you could be a judge, and also you could have a practice on the side. You could be a judge in federal courts, and you could also still practice law, which is hard to believe. But it was a different system. Today, I think the courts are, are much different than they used to be, and I think it's probably better for the country. And for those who don't know the constitutional history, when the Constitution was written, it wasn't actually decided at that time that, this, that the courts could discern, decide that an act of Congress was unconstitutional. But in the famous Marbury versus Madison case in 1803, that was the first time where the Supreme Court said, this action is unconstitutional and you can't do it. And from that point on, the courts have been able to determine that there's something that Congress is doing or other parts of the government are doing is unconstitutional. And that's really given the uh, Supreme Court the power that they have when they can declare something unconstitutional and, and the other branches of government respect it. In some other countries, they might say, we don't care what your court says. We have the army. We're going to do what we want. But in our country, um, whatever the court says, that is actually honored by the rest of the government. For your point about the TV cameras looks different for the first time in light of our discussion of transparency in Congress. And you may be right that the lack of transparency has increased the court's authority. Is judicial independence under threat today? Or are the American courts well insulated from political pressures? Well, on transparency, the Supreme Court is transparent in the sense they write very detailed opinions. And the judiciary is very transparent. They just don't have. We don't have in federal courts, we don't have television, but, but it is transparent. We do know the audio of what they're saying. They get that out right away. The biggest worry I have about the judiciary's independence is this. I, we pay our judges very modest salaries. The judges are basically paid roughly the same as members of Congress. And because we're afraid of increasing our salaries of members of Congress, or members of Congress are afraid of increasing their salaries, and the justices are basically uh, paid roughly the same, you have to get, ask a, a person to serve on the court, the Supreme Court of the United States, for example, for $170,000 or roughly $180,000. Chief Justice may get a little bit more. If you are a clerk on the Supreme Court, let's suppose you're a top law student and you go to Yale Law School as you did or Harvard Law School, University of Chicago Law School where I went, and you're a top student, you can clerk on the Supreme Court. You clerk on the Supreme Court, I believe the salary is roughly, I think it's like $200,000 a year today as a clerk. Uh, is that right? It sounds like a clerk in the audience. No, how much is it? How uh, much? It's it's not probably much more than a justice, but it's around what a justice is paid. Let's suppose it's 170,000, pretty much what a justice is paid. When you when you leave the court, you go practice law. You get a signing bonus, typically in law firms, of 250,000 dollars. Plus, you get a salary of let's say 200,000 dollars. So you're probably getting paid. Maybe uh, maybe a clerk gets paid 150,000 or something like that. They are paid immediately when they go work, maybe $500,000, including their bonus. The justices for whom they're working are still working for roughly $170,000. The amazing thing is that we can get really talented people to serve at rel relatively modest salaries compared to what they could make, and we have so little, so little corruption in the federal system. There may be some corruption in some state and local judiciary systems you read about from time to time, but you hardly ever see any or hear about, because it doesn't exist, corruption in the federal system. But think about it. You're asking judges to basically work for life at a very modest salary compared to what they could otherwise make. 
and I worry that if we don't increase judges' salary and justice salary soon, you won't get really good people. You'll get people who are of lesser quality. And one of the most important things about our country has been getting the best people to serve as judges and justices, and I think we're diminishing that. The media. A hugely important question to James Madison, who at the end of his life is worried that new media technologies like the broadside press won't sufficiently unite people of different interests, from farmers to manufacturers to bankers. This is a media revolution, and debate is happening really fast, and we have Twitter mobs and Brexit polls rather than long debates over the Federalist Papers, which take a long time to read. What would the framers make of our media today, and is it promoting the thoughtful deliberation, and is it slowing down popular passions in the way the framers thought was necessary? Yeah, I often wonder if Thomas Jefferson, who was just a couple blocks away um, in an apartment that he rented, he was writing the Declaration of Independence. And when he was doing that, he was like most, uh, most of us, he was given 17 days to write the Declaration of Independence before he had to turn it in. What did he do? He waited the last two or three days. <laughs> That's not true. Busy, it's busy. So he sat down and write, wrote it out. Now, suppose he had to um, respond to emails. And as you know, if you don't respond to an email within an hour, somebody thinks you don't like them anymore. Um, suppose he had to be busy putting out tweets while he was writing the Declaration of Independence. Um, would we have a Declaration of Independence that is as thoughtful and as careful and as clear about what it is to be an American if the person writing it had to do tweets, respond to emails? Obviously, it's somewhat facetious to say that, but I do think that uh, today, we value attention deficit disorder more than we value thoughtful thinking and deliberative um, kind of um, thought processes. So it's unfortunate today that all of us have to respond to emails and tweets and everything. And if you have attention deficit disorder, you might be seen as actually being able to survive better in this world than if you actually are a thoughtful person. So could Beethoven have written those symphonies if he had to respond to tweets? Could Mozart have written his pieces if he had to respond to tweets or he had to be tweeting or he had to respond to emails? I don't know the answer to it. Um, I'm glad we, I don't have to know the answer to it. But I do think that we, we today have a world where the media is in taking so much time and attention and everybody feels they have to be so connected that if you're unconnected, you're, you're not really uh, you know, fulfilling your job as a citizen. For example, how many of you here um, will wait 24 hours before responding to an email? Okay. How many of you wait 48 hours? How many of you get upset if somebody doesn't respond to your email within 24 hours? How many get upset if they don't respond within an hour? Okay. So how many of you do tweeting? How many of you follow people? Okay. And how many of you feel today that the world is better off because we have tweeting? Okay. How many of you wish we didn't have tweeting? Okay. <laughs> So I, I think it's a different phenomenon that, w that, the f that we have today than the Founding Fathers had to, had to deal with. And it was a completely different world then in terms of communication. I do think that the communication revolution, which has benefited all of us in many ways, has had some downsides. And I think one of the downsides is that probably we don't um, allow people to think as deliberatively as possible. We ask people to respond very quickly to things. And I think Madison, uh, as much as he worried about the media, he, if he came back today, of course he is here, um, he would probably say, this is far worse than anything I ever in anticipated. Well, maybe this very large macro question uh, is uh, a note on uh, which nearly to end. Madison sees a tension between populism and constitutionalism. He studied failed republics like Greece and Rome. He thinks direct democracy degenerates into demagogues and the mob. And he wants to set up a republic by which he means filtering the direct expression of the popular will to slow things down and ensure that the oh. best representatives come up with the best policies. Right. All of the things we've been talking about cut against that Madisonian vision and from tweeting and Facebook to direct polls, direct democracy is rampant. How can we resurrect some of the filters on the direct expression of popular will that Madison thought was necessary for the whole system to survive? Well, there were no real agrarian reformers in the Constitutional Convention. They, they were worried about democracy. Remember, the people in the Constitutional Convention represented the upper 1% of the 1%. Uh, they didn't really pretend that they were representing the 85 percent of were small farmers, and they didn't really care to do so that much. They were afraid that those people, if they were allowed to vote, might do something dangerous. So that's why they had filters like the Electoral College and other kinds of things. And they were not really interested in seeing true democracy. And Madison's studies of Grange and Greece made him think that if you have too big a group, it really, democracy really can't work. Um, I think today um, we have a pretty good balance where people can vote in elections. 
Uh, we have the Electoral College, which doesn't allow direct election to the president. We've seen in two cases in our lifetime where that has resulted in a permanent becoming president who wasn't really directed, elected by the uh, direct popular vote. If the founding fathers had come back today and saw that system, I don't know whether they would have changed or not. I suspect they probably would have been happy with the system they, they have. I, I just think generally we, we should be thankful of people like Madison and others who came up with a system that, while imperfect, still works today. And go back and think about this. How many other things that are 230 years old are still working today? Very few things. Very few things that are 20 years old are still working. This system has had very modest amendments. Some countries have constitutions and they have been modified hundreds of times, hundreds of times. We've had relatively modest modifications of this, this uh, constitution. So I don't know whether it was by divine inspiration or what it was that enabled these 55 people, really 39 who signed it, to come up with something that works 230 years later. But I think we should be thankful for it. And I think we should also learn as much as we can about the Constitution. Try to read the Constitution if you can once a year. Remind yourself what's in it. Very few people do that. Very few people know what's in it. But I think those citizens that do will benefit and be better citizens. Not once a year, but once a week or once a day. Pick a different provision, learn about it, read the interactive constitution, listen to the arguments on both sides as you approach issues in the news. Think about them from a constitutional, not a political perspective, and recognize that your political and constitutional views may sometimes diverge. In order to do that, you have to do just what we've been doing now, which is learning about the constitution and its history, and for helping educate Americans about the constitution on Constitution Day, Please join me in thanking David Rudisheim. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Tonight at 6:30, come see Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. It's going to be great.